on the topic of the census and redistricting and engagement going forward, a, a couple of things that I wanted to, to share with folks. Uh, so uh, I'm Sean Sucker Nicholson. I'm in Kansas City. Uh, I work with Denise and a lot of other organizations, Sal and others, on engagement and advocacy around the census, um, around um, redistricting to ensure that the maps, the new state legislative districts that we have, the new congressional districts, um, and even down to the local level are representative of our, our full communities, that they get us the government um, that we deserve and the representation that we need so that uh, government from local level to Congress is responsive to the people um, and uh, that we can get all that together. Um, we are right now in the middle of the state legislative redistricting process, and there are a lot of issues that have come up over the last couple of years. Um, choices that were made around the US Census are now impacting how um, districts are gonna be drawn in Missouri now, and then that will impact ways that we can engage going forward. Uh, so a couple of things that I just wanted to lift up and then we can have a conversation and um, have a uh, discussion. Um, one, there was, um, with all, taking a step back. So the citizenship question that was on the US census for a while and then not, yes, was about uh, depressing participation um, across the country, but it was also part of a larger effort um, from uh, a small set of radical gerrymandering activists who wanted to change how our maps are drawn in very fundamental ways. Right now, everyone counts in every state legislative district, um, whether you are um, a citizen, whether you're a non-citizen, um, whether you're a voter right now or not a voter yet because um, you happen to be 12. Uh, there was a, an effort underway um, in Texas, in Georgia, here in Missouri, uh, that sought to change that so that only eligible voters would count in the population votes. Um, this was an explicit goal of um, folks when they were but when the legislature was trying to push uh, the uh, Amendment 3 last year, the change redistricting rules, and it has um, bubbled up a little bit again this year. The good news um, is that with the removal of the citizenship question with litigation in 2020, the data set does not exist to change uh, the radical way that, uh, to, to engage this um, radical scheme to change the population base. Um, we still think folks are gonna try. You may see lawsuits filed, um, in the new year uh, to fundamentally change who counts. Um, it is an explicit goal of this to advantage, um, in the words of the guy who really drove the strategy, non-Hispanic whites and Republicans. Uh, that is that is who would benefit from this change. And that was um, not an accident. That is a feature, not a bug to the people who are pushing this. Um, and the, the, what the data show in Missouri is that this scheme would have the same discriminatory impact uh, in Missouri that it does in other states around the country. Um, so my browser is fighting with me um, with the software in terms of sharing my screen, but I might come back to that um, after Denise talks. I need to fiddle with some settings. Uh, but the deal on the table with doing this um, and changing representation would essentially be to take one in five white voters off the population base out of the mix, um, deprive them of representation, and then at the same time take one in four black voters or black Missourians out of the representation base, and then half the Latino and um, Asian Missourian population out of the out of uh, the state. So it is radical um, and discriminatory in impact and design, and it's um, super bad news. And we could talk about that more later. Um, but on the good news front, um, so we are fighting that. We are stopping that. Happy to go into details on the why and the and the all of that. Um, but we are. Uh, in the middle of the redistricting that's happening right now. And there are really amazing tools and there's really amazing work that's happening with Sal, with Denise, um, with uh, folks around the state to define and lift up communities so that they are fully represented um, in our new maps. Um, and then also, as you think about advocacy and work going forward, the tools that are being used right now for redistricting are gonna have a lot of additional benefit for all sorts of work uh, going forward. We can visualize and see and interact with the data about um, what our neighborhoods look like, what our communities look like, what our state looks like um, in brand new and exciting ways. And I'll um, uh, I'll kick it over to Denise and I'm gonna fight with my computer a little bit more. Um, and then I'll, I'll sh share some of those resources. Hi, 
Hi, good morning. Uh, and I, I, I know that we are waiting uh, for uh, my co-presenter to join us. I think she might be in a different breakout room, but um, we're just gonna we're just gonna make this conversation work because we're all we're all in this. Say, we're really all fighting for the same thing, and and that is to ensure that all voices are heard. I'm grateful to be here today. My name is Denise Lieberman. I'm the director and the general counsel for the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition, which is a nonpartisan statewide network of advocates who work to protect our freedom to vote here in Missouri, um, with particular focus on um, uh, communities of color, ethnic minorities, low wage workers, young voters, including students like some that you have, uh, seniors, voters with disabilities, and English plus communities who are hardest hit by um, barriers to the ballot and are also the intended targets of many voter suppression efforts. I'm going to share my screen and share with you um, really just a few of the uh, kind of top issues that we're working on right now. Um, but before I do, I want to actually re-emphasize something that Sean just talked about, because we are in the middle of the redistricting process right now. And here in Missouri, um, our legislature eliminated a process that voters overwhelmingly approved to help make that process less political and less discriminatory. Um, but that doesn't mean that we are bound to have um, discriminatory district lines that drown people out. What we know is that when people participate in the process, they can effectuate change. And so I, I want to just give a, a particular plug to the work that Sean is doing with the Fair Maps Missouri Coalition because redistricting commission hearings, public hearings are happening right now as we speak across the state of Missouri and they need to hear from you. They need to hear from communities across this state. Don't assume that the members of Missouri's redistricting commissions know what your community looks like. They're going to get data. They're going to get census data, right? They're going to get numbers. But what those numbers don't tell is the full story of what your communities mean to you. And we know that in Missouri, we have seen an increase in the Latino population since the last census. And that needs to be taken into consideration to ensure that Latino communities are fully heard in this process. So I urge you to show up at these redistricting commission hearings. Talk about what your community is. Talk about what it means to you. Is it, a, is it important that a, your school district remain part of a, the same district? Is it important that, um, that a particular community that may straddle two different city lines, but is, that is cohesive in its culture and its values um, is, is maintained? Those are the kinds of stories that is important to present and I strongly urge you to do so. I see my co-presenters here now and I'm gonna share my screen uh, and pull up these slides. And I think this is gonna allow me to do so. So like I said, I'm the director and the general counsel of the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition. We're nonpartisan statewide network of voter advocates who work to protect our freedom to vote. And I think that's really important to say because too often, it's particularly right now, the debates that we have on who has access to the ballot and on what terms have been relegated to highly partisan divisiveness. And that doesn't have to be the case. The truth of the matter is, historically and right now, we can all agree, regardless of our political uh, beliefs, that all people deserve to have a say in their own communities, to have a voice in their own destinies, to be able to impact decisions that affect them and their children. Uh, and that is why our work is nonpartisan, because the freedom to vote applies to everybody. And the truth is, we don't have a free and fair democracy if all people in our communities aren't, don't have a seat at the table. And one famous civil rights activist said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And this is particularly true for um, racial and ethnic minorities whose voices have been silenced for far too long. 
So the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition undertakes this mission through four buckets of work. That includes policy advocacy. We track legislation at the state and national level that affect the freedom to vote for Missourians. We do strategic litigation. You're going to hear a little bit more about in, in a few minutes from my colleague here um, to, to ensure that all Missourians have access to the ballot, in particular to fight um, voting practices that have a discriminatory impact on our state's racial and ethnic minorities. We do it for the voter education and, and engagement programs like this. Um, we produce palm cards and toolkits to make sure that people have access to accurate and trusted information. When we know that when people are armed with information about their rights, they're able to effectively assert their rights. And I don't need to tell all of you this because you're teachers and you know the value of education. And finally, our signature service program is that we coordinate nonpartisan election protection efforts in the state of Missouri. This includes um, a slew of attorneys. Um, we partner with bar associations at, here in Missouri, Missouri attorneys, taking calls into the election protection hotline and literally thousands of volunteers who help monitor the polls on election day to provide immediate assistance to ensure that no voter has to leave their polling place without casting a ballot. Our coalition meets every single Monday at 10 a.m. via Zoom to get updates on what's happening on the state of voting rights here in Missouri and across the country. And I invite you to join us. You can get on our mailing list by texting MOVPC to 66866 or you can just email us at info at movpc.org. I mentioned that we produce a lot of educational materials, and, and I want to just highlight a couple of these palm cards that we produce to help make sure that people have access to trusted information. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that we um, are, are so grateful for um, the folks on our Language Access Committee, which is chaired by uh, one of your friends, Sal Valadez. Um, as well as Caroline Fan with the Asian American Youth Foundation, who help ensure that these materials get translated into six different languages. I'm just showing you the Spanish language palm cards here, but we also have them in Chinese and Korean and Vietnamese and Tegu uh, and several other languages that help um, ensure that people have access to information in ways that they can actually access. And I really also want to plug this election protection hotline. Um, 866-R-VOTE is answered. You can actually call this any time, um, but on election day, it's live with attorneys here in Missouri answering those calls. If you call right now, you'll likely get um, an answering machine, but you will get a return call within 24 hours. But what's also important to know is that our national partners have crafted language access hotlines. And so there is a hotline that is answered in Spanish, 888-VE-VOTA, 888-839-8682, to help ensure that all people have access to information and um, resources and support to cast their ballot. So I'm going to highlight just a couple of key things um, at the 30,000 foot level that we are working on. Um, we're doing a lot of policy work right now to help ensure that all people have access to the ballot. And um, uh, because of its timeliness, I'm gonna highlight two pieces of federal legislation, including the Freedom to Vote Act that just came to it uh, for an initial vote earlier this week. It was blocked by Senate Republicans, but this is not over. Uh, this legislation is going to continue to move forward. And one thing that it does, circling back to Sean's presentation, is it would ban partisan gerrymandering to help ensure that um, all voices are heard and create a more fair redistricting process. But it would do other things as well by creating a minimum floor of access to ensure that regardless of where you live, regardless of your race, regardless of your zip code, that you will have access to cast a ballot. What we know is that the way people vote differs from state to state, even from county to county. But here in Missouri, we have particularly low levels of access because we um, have a lot of procedures in place that make voting needlessly hard. This legislation would, among other things, make election day a federal holiday, protecting the interests of low wage workers and shift workers who may find it difficult to get to the polls on that particular Tuesday. 
Uh, it would ensure access to early voting, which we don't have here in Missouri. It would ensure access to mail-in ballots, which voters are not guaranteed in Missouri. So this measure came to an initial vote this week, but we're going to see more action on this measure in the next several weeks in the United States Senate at Senate Bill 2747. And you can see here on this slide that this measure is really a game changer for Missouri because we rank so close to the bottom compared to other states in making voting accessible. This would do a lot, particularly for our state's ethnic and racial minorities who already face the greatest barriers to being able to cast ballots on election day by ensuring access to early voting, voting by mail, automatic voter registration, same day voter registration. We're also supporting the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act that would restore the protections of the Voting Rights Act that have for years helped block racially discriminatory voting laws from going into effect. Those measures were weakened by several Supreme Court decisions. This legislation would restore those protections. This bill has already passed out of the House of Representatives and is likely coming to an initial vote in the United States Senate next week. Please um, keep your eyes peeled on this. But here in Missouri, I want to flag a couple of things we're looking at because the reason we need these bills is that around the country, our freedom to vote is under attack. In 2021 alone, over 425 restrictive voting bills were introduced in 49 out of the 50 states, including here in Missouri. And our lawmakers here in Jefferson City in Missouri are poised to fast track several bills that would affect our ability to vote here in Missouri in 2022. And the one I want to highlight is a measure that is likely to pass that would um, eliminate some of the forms of identification voters can show at the polls to implement strict photo ID requirements to vote. This slide shows you, in essence, what this would do. It would eliminate forms of ID that voters can currently use to cast a ballot in Missouri, including a student identification card that so many students at colleges and universities around the, the state rely upon including that voter registration card that you get from the election authority that verifies you are in fact a registered voter. Leaving just the kind of ID that you typically have to get at the DMV. And that's where the problem comes in. Um, not every county in Missouri has a DMV office. Many are not located on public transportation routes. So people who don't have access to transportation may find it difficult. Many are not open evenings and weekends, again, disparately impacting our low wage workers and shift workers, uh, people who have child care and elder care responsibilities. And importantly, in order to get one of these forms of ID, you have to present underlying documents that prove your identity, residency and citizenship like a certified birth certificate. And if those underlying documents don't match your voter registration, you may be blocked in getting a state ID. This has a disparate impact um, on voters of color, but in particular on Latino voters because of the compound surnames that many Latinos use, right? Using the maternal surname and the paternal surname. Many of my clients in lawsuits that I filed challenging photo ID laws um, incorporate both their mother and their father's surnames into their names. but. American identifications don't have a lot of room for this. And so sometimes that maternal surname is listed as a middle name. Sometimes it's listed as a last name or a compound last name. And those things don't match, leading to that disparate impact on our Latino uh, citizens and our residents. And that is why, um, in part, we're fighting these proposals in the Missouri legislature. And we are planning on um, bringing a lawsuit to challenge uh, any such legislation um, if it improperly and just um, leaves out and discriminates against our voters, in particularly voters of color and Latino voters in Missouri. Denise? Finally, and I, I'm, I'm ending right here. I'm about okay. to transfer over. Uh, okay. The final thing that we're looking at, of course, is language access that affects Latino voters in Missouri. Uh, and this is something that affects over 25 million Americans. Uh, and while the Voting Rights Act, which is national legislation, requires some places to provide bilingual voting materials or language assistance, Missouri is not required to do so. However, there are important laws that ensure that 
people can get assistance at the polls. In Missouri, you can request help from election officials or a person of your choice if you need help reading or casting your ballot. But there's a glitch. Missouri has a limit that people who want to provide that help, people who want to provide translation services, they can only help one voter. And that is why we have teamed up with our friends at the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund to try and remedy this problem. Please join us if you want to get in further contact with us. My contact information is on the screen, denise at movpc.org. And please join an upcoming weekly call if you're interested in learning more. I'm turning it over now to uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Griselda Vega Samuel with the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, am I good? I hope I'm good. I can't tell. Um, buenos dias. Mi nombre es Griselda Vega Samuel, and I am the regional counsel for, as Denise said, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, also known as MALDEF. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you and share a little bit about MALDEF. Uh, for many of you, you may know who we are. MALDEF has, is the known as sort of the Latino um, civil rights organizations for uh, all Latinos across the country. We've been around for over 50 years fighting to ensure and protect the civil rights of all Latinos across the country. Um, and uh, oh, let's see, I thought we had a slide from uh, Denise. Uh, let's see, can we have the slide back on? Uh, I'll walk you through it uh, while they put the, the slides back on. But essentially, um, MALDEF, like, as I said, has been working on protecting the civil rights of Latinos across the country for the last 50 years. And we do that through both impact litigation, which is bringing lawsuits, uh, representing hundreds of people across the country, to also doing a lot of policy advocacy um, at, the, at the various le uh, levels of government. And I always say that I, I, I particularly think that um, it's uh, great to have both of those tools at our disposal, given that litigation takes a long time. And so it's great to be able to have both of those um, uh, options open. So as I said, uh, we've been working on um, these issues for over the last 50 years, and we really focus on four uh, main areas. One is um, education. A lot of people know us for our Plyler decision, which uh, as you as important to all of you teachers is the right for every child to have access to public education from K through 12 and that was through a Supreme Court decision that Malda fought for um, and so as you all know education issues are still very much uh, a concern across the country so we keep fighting those issues uh, labor and employment issues as well um, I'm an employment lawyer by trade I've been doing it for the last 20 years um, representing uh, undocumented workers and all workers because all workers have rights. Um, and so we fight those uh, cases as well. We recently won a big uh, lawsuit um, or settled, I should say, against Procter & Gamble for discriminating against DACA recipients for um, having only a two year work authorization. So um, currently we are in the process of uh, ensuring that all of those people who were discriminated against were in fact um, gonna be able to get compensated. And immigrant rights, we also work on that. And that what I like to say is we are not immigration attorneys. So we traditionally are not going to help with deportation defense, et cetera, but we do focus on the civil rights of immigrants. And in that case, uh, we represented um, a young man who was in a detention center um, who was at high risk for COVID. And so we wanted to make sure that he had the right to be released from that um, detention center because he was at high risk of, 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 of getting sick and then potentially dying. And so we have won those types of cases as well. Um, and obviously political access and voting rights, which is what we're here to talk about to you today. And as um, Denise mentioned, language access is so critical, especially for a community that's growing like you are in Missouri, right? I mean, I like to say Latinos are growing in all, we're everywhere across the state, across the United States. And so the reason our work is, is going to be so important here in Missouri is because you are such a growing uh, community. And so um, I, the language access issue is particularly important because, um, as uh, 
Denise was mentioning, there in Missouri is not required to actually provide any sort of language assistant, whether that's translation, interpretation, or bilingual uh, materials. And similarly, in Arkansas, is in the same spot. And so I want to tell you about a, a case we are currently uh, fighting in Arkansas, right your neighbor next door, is uh, a language issue, a language access case as well. So we are fighting the state of Arkansas because they have a restriction similar to the one that um, Denise mentioned Missouri has, except Arkansas's restriction is you could only help six people. And so for our client who we represent, Arkansas United, is a small nonprofit um, that is helping the community, but of course they have a small staff. So if you only have a staff of 10 and you are limited to helping six people with language access, that's a problem because we are growing and we have the right to, under the federal law, to have assistance by someone we choose. So that case is currently ongoing. We had a really great decision this week in that the judge is saying that he's going to be deciding that fairly soon. So we expect a favorable decision and knowing that we can protect the rights of all um, limited English proficient individuals have the access, have the right to access, um, and have an assister of their choice when they go to cast a vote. So stay tuned because hopefully we'll be having a, a, a win there soon. But the important part and why we are looking at this restriction in Missouri that um, um, that um, Denise mentioned is because what she said is true. Missouri is actually far more restrictive than Arkansas, where you could only if you as a as an individual want to help your neighbor, you can only help that one neighbor. And so I don't know about you, but if, you know, my neighbor usually has a senor y senora, and so you could only help one of them if, if they needed help. And so that's a problem. And so what we've been doing is looking at that restriction. Now, why is that so important to us? As I mentioned, the Latino community in Missouri is growing. Just so you know, um, is uh, one of the facts I like to share is that there are 800,000 young people, and for you as teachers, this is so important, and you have such an impact on those young people. 800,000 young people nationally are able to register to vote. We are the largest minority majority in the United States, as the census has told us, and our young community is growing, and the ability to register to vote and cast that vote is going to be so important. And so all of those young people are going to be able to help our tios and tias and abuelitas who, you know, like my parents, have limited English proficiency. And so they need that help and they have the right to that help. And so we want to be able to help our community and our neighbors because they are being harmed by these very restrictive laws. So if you've ever wanted to help someone, if and you haven't been able to, or if you want to help someone in the future, we want to talk to you because we believe that the, every person has the right to choose someone of their of their own to go help them cast a vote. So that's what uh, Denise was mentioning. We are going to want to work together to be able to do that. Um, I will mention two quick other things. Another um, lawsuit that we are currently working on and you guys are doing as well, as our, my colleagues previously mentioned, is redistricting. So this is another way for you to get involved. Redistricting is so important because it is basically our seat at the table, as um, Denise was mentioning, right? And in, here in Illinois, we have sued the state of Illinois because I want to unfortunately say that even though the Latino community grew, and that is the only reason that Illinois didn't lose a congressional seat, we were not given our fair share of districts when it came to legislative districts. And so we sued the state of Illinois and we got a great decision this week because the court agreed with us. They said the maps were bad, they are not representative of the Latino community and you legislature have to do them over. And so we are in the process of doing that again. But what was critical in that moment is that not only was it our lawsuit that was important, but your voices. And this is another way for you to engage. You are, as, as uh, Denise was mentioning and my colleague before that, there are redistricting hearings going on right now. You have the ability to testify and it's so important for them to hear about your neighborhood because they need to know that we're present. Es hacemos hacer acta de presencia and just be there and let them know that we are here to stay and we need to be represented because it is our time. And so I will leave you with the following things. 
This is my contact information. As I mentioned, you should have a flyer in your materials talking about all of the various work that we do. Um, MALDEF is a national organization with offices across the country. I'm based in Chicago, but we represent your state. I have 14 states that I cover and Missouri is one of them as it indicates in that flyer. Please take a look at the flyer, call us with any questions. We are a resource. We speak Spanish and we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. And if we can't help you, we will refer you to someone. But I will leave you with these three things. How do you get involved and how do you get your students involved? You register to vote, right? I mentioned we are the largest growing community and we have a, we're going to have a lot of political power and access to voting. So let's register everybody. Second, redistricting. Participate in your redistricting committees and testify. You could do it either live or you can submit testimony. I encourage you to do both because you have a right to tell those legislators who, what's happening in your community and why the line should stay the way they should and be able to elect someone of your choice. And finally, language access. We're talking about the right for every person to be able to cast a vote and do it in a way that is informed and that is that it represents who, what they need to know on all of those uh, election materials. So Missouri is restricting that. We want to be able to fight that. And if you want to help in that fight, please reach out and let us know. Griselda, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you so much, you all. When we're not on, when we're not presenting, can we have our cameras off? Our technology is all over the place because we're blowing out the internet, which is a good thing for us to um, to have moving forward. So who I would like to go next, um, Nancy, I would like for you to talk about what's going on with Medicaid and how um, folks can really get engaged and move forward with that. And then Sean, um, I would like for you to close this out around um, the different things that we have going on with redistricting and how we're trying to get our power back around that. My name is Cecilia Belzer Patton. I'm the moderator for today. We're sorry we had some technical issues and now we are ready to go. So Nancy, can you kind of um, update everyone on things that are going on around Medicaid um, implementation? We have expanded in the state of Missouri and now implementation in ways in which people can get involved and move forward. Yes, thanks, Cecilia. I am not sure where my slides are, so let's see if I can um, share real quick. And if not, I will just go with it. I'll you help you either way. Are you being able to share? Do you have access? I can share, but I can't. <laughs> I, I am not seeing my slides um, at the same time, so. We can just get started and if you find them. We will we just can, go with it and go. you can hear me and I'm sure okay. that I can provide these and have them as the follow-up afterwards. So thank you. Yes, thanks Cecilia. Thank you um, to LEC. I'm honored to be welcomed to your group to talk about Medicaid expansion. I am with Missouri Foundation for Health. Uh, our mission is to eliminate underlying causes of health disparities um, by transforming systems and enabling individuals and communities to thrive. Um, when I was listening to the values of LEC, one of them echoes what we talk about a lot, which is integrity. So I really appreciate that and resonate with that. Um, in terms of Medicaid expansion in Missouri, and I know we have folks that may not be from Missouri, um, particularly Kansas, hopefully you're right behind us in terms of expanding Medicaid. Um, and some of this information will still be useful, but um, it, we're really concentrated on Missouri and the fact that we did have voters approve Medicaid expansion about a year ago, last August. It's taken a while, long journey. I won't go into all of that, but the good news is October 1st of this year, our uh, state, um, it's Family Support Division, FSD is the group that actually um, processes those applications. So applications have started being processed as of October the 1st. Um, so it's an exciting time. It's a time of learning and it's really um, a time for an enormous awareness and enrollment effort. It is, uh, the research has told us that there's 275,000 Missourians who will be newly eligible uh, for expanded Medicaid. So we need to get the word out to them. 
Um, and then um, in this particular time of year, Medicaid is open all the time. You can apply any time of year. We are coming up on the ACA open enrollment period, which will start November 1st. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end because the two pieces sort of work together. Um, so just a really quick uh, primer on uh, Medicaid. What is Medicaid? And Medicaid in Missouri is called MoHealthNet. It is a key piece of the safety net for Missourians. It covers 45% of Missouri's children. Um, it also pays for 38% of all births in the state. Um, and one out of every 13 adults that are over age 65, um, typically that's a combination of Medicaid and Medicare together. And two out of three nursing home um, beds, the, the care in Missouri um, are paid. That's two out of three paid by Medicaid. So it's huge um, in terms of how it helps a lot of our friends and neighbors. Um, right now, uh, Medicaid program provides health insurance to over 1 million low-income Missourians. And again, that's kids, that's parents, uh, individuals with disabilities, pregnant women, seniors, and now with expansion, it's also adults who don't have children. Um, to be eligible, um, there's a lot of um, not a lot, there's a few eligibility requirements. There is the um, the piece about um, being a Missouri citizen. Uh, this is for um, for the expansion piece. It's age 19 to 64 years old, because of course you've got Medicare after that, and there are those exceptions that I just mentioned, and then kids on the other end. Um, but Missouri citizens, uh, an adult earning less than 138% of the federal poverty level, which what does that mean in numbers? For an individual, um, that's earning $17,775 a year. Or if, you know, there's a whole chart for all the, the numbers, but for family of four, just to give you reference, that's um, earning up to $36,750 a year. So it, it is pretty inclusive for a lot of people who have a little bit of a lower income. Um, just one note about how COVID-19 has really impacted enrollment. Um, that million uh, mark is uh, of people enrolled, that is a high, that's a high number. And that is partly due to COVID-19 for two reasons. One is that Missourians have lost jobs um, and they have lower incomes so they may qualify and they may have lost their employer coverage um, that they had when they were employed. So that's one piece about the employment. And then the other is um, there is a public health emergency, a national public health emergency that is in place. Um, and while that is in place, there's a, there's a lot of ins and outs to it. But the bottom line is that Medicaid cannot drop people and cannot demand renewals um, during a public health emergency. So everyone, once you're in, you're in. So everyone has stayed on the rolls, even though um, they, you know, they haven't had to uh, like re-up or reprove their their um, income. So all of that is like the quickest um, you can hear about what is Medicaid, but what is our opportunity here? Um, the main message that I hope that you walk away with is that we need to let those 275,000 uh, Missourians know that the rules have changed. Um, in particular with you all, um, that is a prime opportunity for it's to reach um, parents through schools. Um, oftentimes um, kids will be covered either by Medicaid or CHIP, which is the Ch Children's Health Insurance Program. Um, but the parents aren't necessarily eligible or hadn't been, but now are. Um, and even if, um, just a special note, when we're talking about kids, um, it is very important, especially working with families that may have some mixed status in their, their family, um, even if the adults are um, not in the country legally, are not um, eligible, uh, if their children have been born in the United States, they are very likely to be eligible for Medicaid services. So really wanting to get that message out to go ahead and apply and um, see if, if they can benefit from getting that coverage. Um, one of the ways as we're thinking about specific outreach, 
um, helping families when they come in and, and it may be educators, it may be other staff at the um, school, the school nurses, but going through the health forms and other forms, make sure that this news is included. I will share a bunch of resources that you can just print off or share electronically about what you need, um, how you enroll, all of the different details. Um, in addition, we're conscious that some staff at schools um, may not um, have coverage through their jobs, but they may be qualified because of their income. So making sure that we're spreading word to them as well. Um, I am gonna put in the chat a link to um, a fact sheet that we have developed um, and it is uh, about immigrant and refugees, particularly um, this would be applicable, I believe uh, for the most part, except for the kind of the contact information um, that that is um, going to be true in Missouri and in other states as well. We've had attorneys to review this and make sure that it's accurate. It is really just the starting point because everyone uh, who's worked with anything with immigration or refugees knows it's fairly complex. Um, but we do know overall top line, many immigrants have statuses which make them eligible for Medicaid. Um, so in particular, permanent residents, you know, known as green card holders, um, refugees and asylees, there's some special programs for them, um, including the refugee medical assistance uh, for new refugees, which lasts up to eight months. Um, and then another piece that we really want to make sure that people have heard loud and clear and hear repeatedly is that the 2019 public charge rule change that we had under the previous um, federal administration is no longer in effect. I know that caused a lot of questions and a lot of fear, frankly, for people. It is no longer in effect. Um, so it is also um, important for people to know that there are resources available about Medicaid that's translated into multiple languages. Um, I will talk about those in a minute, but um, the, we work, the Missouri Foundation for Health works with um, our statewide organization called Cover Missouri uh, Coalition. And we have on the MFH website, which I have a link in the slides where I will put in the chat and also provide um, uh, after the fact, um, if we can get these slides out to attendees. Um, but there's there's a lot of handouts um, about how to enroll, about social media, um, different um, information, talking points, and we have that in a variety of languages um, and everything is pretty much in English and Spanish and then some things, select things are in other languages. So um, there are different ways to apply to um, Medicaid in Missouri. Someone can do it online by going to mydss.mo.gov. Um, there's a phone number for the uh, Family Support Division Call Center, and then people can access it by um, paper application as well if they don't have uh, internet access. There's also help available. Um, there are um, the Cover Missouri Coalition has the Find Local Help tool. I will put that link in the chat too when I'm finished. Um, that is at covermissouri.org, um, cover Missouri uh, slash help. And that is where someone can put in their zip code, they can put in their um, county, and they can get um, who is helping near them, is there language assistance, those kind of things. There's also a Cover Missouri Call Center, 800-466-3213 uh, that I will also add to the chat. Um, if someone doesn't want to go online for the Find Local Help tool, they can call that number. Um, again, a lot of this is um, an effort to inform and spread the word. So um, as you go to Missouri Foundation for Health's website, we have a whole page about Medicaid expansion where all of this, uh, these resources live. Um, there is a messaging guide. So if you're not sure kind of like how to bring this topic up or you want to just have a couple facts to, to mention, it's all there printed out for you. Um, social media toolkit, as I mentioned, posters, flyers, handouts, videos, um, all of that is available um, for, for you. It's free to free to use, free to take. We want as much of it to go out as possible. 
Um, again, the Cover Missouri Coalition is a statewide group. We have nearly a hundred, uh, I'm sorry, a thousand members. Everyone's dedicated to quality, affordable health coverage for all Missourians. Um, good way to stay updated about what's going on for Medicaid and also the ACA's marketplace. Um, and you don't have to live in Missouri to be part of it. If you want to um, just kind of follow along and, and see what might apply to your state, we're happy to have you. Um, I will just wrap up with um, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it does tie directly to Medicaid in terms of if someone, there, the, the concept is no wrong door. So if someone starts out and goes to healthcare.gov to apply for the ACA's marketplace coverage, many people call that Obamacare. Um, and it turns out that that site at healthcare.gov determines that this uh, applicant is probably eligible for Medicaid instead, it will automatically send the application over to the Missouri system. So um, someone who um, thought maybe they needed to buy coverage through healthcare.gov may actually benefit from the free Medicaid coverage. They do have a choice if um, a person says, no, I really want to buy this plan through the healthcare.gov. That is allowed. However, um, if they are eligible for Medicaid, they will not qualify for the financial help that four out of five Missourians do benefit from. That's the advanced premium tax credits that bring that monthly premium down, sometimes almost to zero or to zero. And then cost sharing reductions, which reduce your like copay and your out of pocket costs. So someone would have to basically pay the full ticket um, for the premiums and everything that they may have to pay out of pocket. So often at a low income, that's just not affordable. So like I mentioned, um, open enrollment is starting November 1st, and that goes through January 1st. It's extended. Uh, the Biden administration did extend that to January 1st for coverage for 2022. Um, I'd, I'd like to brag on Missouri a little bit. We have nine insurance companies offering plans in, in one or more regions of the state. That is our highest number um, uh, of insurers that we've ever had. And so Missourians then are going to be able to benefit from the from the Affordable Care Act, the key features like no lifetime limits, um, young adults can stay on parents insurance till age of 26, uh, and one that's very popular and super important um, for uh, there's no prohibition for pre-existing conditions. Uh, you can't be excluded. You have to be covered. And um, you cannot be charged more just because you may have a certain health uh, condition. Um, I have rocketed through all of that information. We have, Nancy. Thank you so much. <laughs> you went fast. We appreciate you. So we could get Sean with some time at the end. I saw where you put um, information as well as Sal in the chat. Um, so if there are other things where people can find resources, please feel free to put that in the chat so that folks can have that there. Uh, we're going to move to Sean. Thank you so much, Nancy. We appreciate you. Okay. I will add some things in the chat. Look for those links. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We're going to move to Sean Nicholson. I haven't seen you in forever, sir. What's going on? What's going on? So um, to get this information, um, Sean and I worked together on Clean Missouri um, back in 2018. Sean has been at the front of all of the redistricting that um, trying to help us be more democratic in um in Missouri. So Sean is going to take us through some things. Sean, do you have slides that you're going to use or are you just going to speak to us? And then I want to open it up for questions that people might have and for me to talk about why I think that this is so important for educators. Thanks, Cecilia. Yeah, um, I've, I've attempted to, to share slides, but it looks like it's not working. Um, so I would just say, you know, in addition to um, what we talked about um, at, at the top of the session, Mm -hmm. um, the opportunities for folks to engage are right now with the state legislative redistricting commissions. There's a great public comment portal um, that the state has put together. I will put that in the chat here in a second. Um, what commissioners and the judges that may end up drawing maps may do down the line, um, they need to hear from folks across the state about um, their communities, about what it means when um, communities are split apart across multiple districts in a way that limits their political power. Um, so that are, there's a great opportunity to draw, to talk about um, your own communities, also to talk about the need for fair maps that are uh, representative of the state as a whole. 
um, and fair to everyone. So I'll drop a link to that um, uh, to that public comment portal. Congressional redistricting is then going to happen later in the winter. Um, so if you are particularly interested in congressional redistricting, that is a different process that happens through the state legislature. So if you want to, uh, uh, if you have thoughts, if you want to engage on that, that needs to happen through your existing state representative um, and state senators. Um, so that is, they will be the ones drawing our new congressional district lines. And then there is work happening across the state at the county and municipal levels for other redistricting um, that is coming up. So, um, you know, Kansas City is in the middle of that process right now. St. Louis County, St. Louis City um, are doing their own separate processes down the line. And it just happens piece by piece um, as we go. Um, I will uh, drop uh, some links in the chat here in a second, um, and then I will kick it back to you, Cecilia. Thanks, Sean. Can you kind of, Sean, talk about, um, both Denise and Griselda have also touched on this, but why it's so important for us to engage in our democracy around um, districting lines and around our own um, personal and collective power with how, why this is so important. I think we need to make that, like really help people to understand that in brass tax ways so that they'll wanna move forward in action. Yeah, so um, the first thing I'll say is that the folks, most of the folks who are in power now um, have no actual interest in hearing from the public. They would, if they had their way, um, and if they do have their way, they'll um, draw district lines in a way that protects them or protects their existing interests. Um, and then they don't have to worry too much about voters back home. Um, they don't have to do any of that. They can just uh, focus on what their donors or their uh, political party would, would like them to do. Um, it is important for us to not let that happen and to be engaged because when we have fair maps, when we have fair redistricting, it means that we can hold our elected leaders accountable when they lose their way or when they're not doing the right stuff. It means that we can elect candidates who represent us and are gonna do the right thing when they get into office, whatever um, level of office that may be. Um, and it's important because we have a gross tradition in America of communities getting split apart by politicians, by uh, political consultants and political actors to diminish their political power, to break them apart um, so they can't be full participants in the democracy. Um, so um, to Denise's point before, um, if we aren't at the table and if we aren't part of the process, uh, then uh, folks who are at the table right now are uh, going to keep rolling and they are just fine for us to be on the sidelines. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Sean. You are, this is really important from the perspective of our elected officials in Missouri have shown us time and time again, if we need um, historical evidence and hard evidence, that no matter what we vote for, they're not necessarily interested in what we feel that we need for our highest good and for our neighbor's highest good and for our best democracy. We voted in 2018 that we wanted this redistricting, excuse me, this certain kind of um, nonpartisan redistricting in 2018 with Clean Missouri. They came back and they did all the things that they did to overturn that. We voted on August 5th, 2020, that we were interested in Medicaid. We had to go through all types of fights in order to do that. Denise and Griselda talked about voter engagement and the things that are trying to be done to take away voting rights. And so what we know that we need to do is utilize our influence as educators, utilize our influence as Missouri Missourians, um, both those of us who are citizens and those of us who are not, those of us who reside here, um, to make sure that these folks do what we want them to do and that we can hold them accountable because we have to remember we put them in office and we give them jobs, not the other way around. Okay. So um, during these campaigns, we actively engage with educators and educator um, stakeholders because we knew how important all of these intersectional issues were to our students and their families' health and wellness. And so we're just asking that with all the information and resources that you've been given from Denise, from Griselda, from Nancy, and from Sean, please utilize it and please utilize this to move forward with your own 
ways in which you want to become engaged with making a Missouri, a Missouri that is great for everyone, not just for some. Are there any questions that anyone might have for the panel before we break at noon? All right, I would like for everyone, um, Denise, do you have any last last thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? It all comes down to everybody deserves to have a voice. And, and um, the reason this is so important is because our voice determines our futures and our destinies, right? And so we need to make sure that, uh, you know, everybody, has the right to to basic human dignity because if people don't have the ability to have a say in their own destinies to be able to have to fight for the things they want for their families health care education housing job security then we're not truly free and we know that this doesn't come without a fight because there are people who benefit from fewer voices in the room Absolutely. and less diverse voices in the room. Absolutely. And that is simply un-American, it's undemocratic, and frankly, it's immoral. And so the reason we need to make sure that district lines are fair, we're not talking about getting an, an undue advantage, we're simply talking about basic fairness, that everybody gets to have a say, that, that those who are have who benefit from undue and unwarranted privilege in society don't get to call all the shots. All of us deserve to have a say. Uh, and, and, and so that's why we need to ensure that we have fair district lines. And that's why we need to ensure that all people have access to be able to make their voices heard. Uh, that is just the core basic essence of democracy. It's not about Democrats or Republicans. It's simply about um, basic fairness and dignity for everybody. And so um, I think this, these, this is an important time. We're truly at a crossroads mm -hmm. in America and in Missouri when it comes to who gets to have a say in their futures and on what terms. And, and I think there's such an opportunity for educators here, those of you who teach government, civics, social studies, but frankly, everything else, history, um, we're really in the middle of, of, of a critical moment right now. And the next three weeks are going to be critical in Congress, whether we're going to see transformative voting reform. And the next few months are critical right here in Missouri as we draw district lines and are going to affect our communities and our children for the next decade ahead. Um, let's engage the next generation of voters in this discussion because they are truly on the, the front lines and on the, on the seats watching history happen right now before us. Now Thanks. is the time to act. Thank you so much. Um, Nancy, is there anything that you would like to end us with? Sorry about that. I don't think I can add anything, but just to say bravo to Denise, listen to her. She said it all. Thank you. Griselda. Okay. Sean, is there anything that you would like to end us with? Sean, if you could give us information about um, how people can get engaged with the redistricting communication and how they can um, move forward with that, that would be great. Yeah, so uh, there are, um, I mentioned the online opportunities. There will mm -hmm. be public hearings coming up in November. I'll mm -hmm. drop my email into the chat right now um, and we can get you plugged in to all of the things that are underway. Thanks so much, Sean. You all, anyone that is in this as a proud board member of Latinx Education Collaborative and um, a proud veteran educator um, and political operative, I just know how important it is for us to engage. If it's not for us, if we don't feel like that we're political, I hear educators say all the time, you know, I'm not political. And what I say is, as long as there is politics and education, I have to be political. The two go hand in hand. We have the power to influence. 
We have the power to allow our voices to be heard. We have the power to encourage our students and their families with their voices. And for those of us who have always um, educated people who are vulnerable, people who have been undervalued, underserved, um, marginalized communities, I think it's our responsibility to help them find their voices. Once they find their voices, they take off and they do the thing. And I think that that is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to engage in political activities that will make it better for our students and our families. And we're imploring you all to do so. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you to our presenters, Denise, Griselda, Nancy, and Sean. You all were wonderful. Thank you all for bearing with us with our techno technology issues. It's a wonderful um, issue to have that you are so jamming and you're so dope that you're breaking the internet and we're kind of breaking the internet right now. So thank you all for being with us. You have a little bit of a break and then we'll see you again for our afternoon activities. Please make sure that you check the chat. It has great information in it. Sal, thank you for all the work that you've been doing across the state around access. Um, we look forward to seeing you all this afternoon.